Hello. In 1900, in the German city of Königsberg, the International Congress of Mathematicians gathered in what could be called a mood of hope and fear. The edifice of maths was grand and ornate, but its foundations, called axioms, were shaking with inconsistency and lurking paradox. And so, at that conference, a brilliant young German mathematician called David Hilbert set out a plan to rebuild them, to make them consistent, all-encompassing, and without any hint of a paradox. Hilbert was one of the greatest mathematicians that ever lived, but his plan failed spectacularly, and it did so because of the incompleteness theorems. These were the work of Kurt. Kurt Girdle, and they changed the way we understand maths, took us to the very limits of logic, and sent challenges <coughs> spilling out into the world of physics, philosophy, and beyond. With me to discuss Girdle's incompleteness theorems are John Barrow, professor of mathematical sciences at the University of Cambridge and Gresham professor of geometry, Philip Welsh, professor of mathematical logic at the University of Bristol, and Marcus Yusotoy, professor of mathematics at Wadham College, University of Oxford. Marcus Yusotoy, as I mentioned in the introduction, the foundations of mathematical systems are called Axioms. So perhaps you could give us foundations for this program by explaining what axioms are. Yeah, this goes really to the heart of what mathematics is about. You start with things that you're you're happy with. The axioms are somehow the basic things of mathematics, things that are obvious. For example, if you take a point, two points, there's a line that you can draw through those two points. So that's one of the axioms of geometry. Or numbers, for example, the fact that if I add six and seven together, it doesn't matter if I then add seven and six, I get the same answer. So the axioms are somehow the things that we all accept as somehow blindingly obvious. And from there, you build mathematics. So you use logic to then make uh, logical deductions from what these axioms state to sort of build up um, theorems. And from theorems, you get more mathematics. So in some sense, the axioms are the foundations, the things that we're happy with, and then you use the rules of deductive logic, things like uh, uh, Aristotle is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Aristotle is mortal. Um, that's a deduction from two things to get a, a, a sort of theorem. So you use the axioms as your starting point, and from there you develop um, the fact, for example, Euclid proves that there are infinitely many primes from these basic axioms. And it did it, could we say, just for conversationally, did it started with Euclid? I, I would say it started with the ancient Greeks. I mean, you, you see a lot of mathematics being done in ancient Babylon and Egypt, but it's the Greeks who really start mathematics off as a, a sort of formal system where you're deducing things from the axioms. And Euclid's elements um, is somehow the climax of this, where he writes down the axioms for geometry and numbers and starts to deduce some of the first great theorems of mathematics. But because of these taken axioms, mathematics assumed the apparel of that discipline above all which got at truth, which penetrated truth, the truth of, uh, of, of, of being, of the universe, and, 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 and gained a great, great status because of that. Exactly. I mean, you, you look at the theorems that the Greeks proved in, in the elements, they are as true today as they were 2,000 years ago, and no other science really has that certainty to it. So the idea of axioms and proof are fundamental to why mathematics gives you what we feel like is 100% certain. And it really marks mathematics out as different from the other sciences where theories get knocked down from one generation. We build on the, on the, the shoulders of giants, as it were, as Newton said, because we, we take anything that's proved within these axioms is, is, is true and therefore can be built on in the next generation. But by the time by the time I come around to 1900, sorry about the 2000 plus, <laughs> 2200 year leap, um, axioms are, seem to be under some sort of threat. Euclid, well, with Euclid's axioms. It, uh, yes, I mean, Which the point is... Which the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Well, the Euclid's axioms were seen to be only part of the story. This is what... The mathematics was beginning to develop so much that we were starting to see very new things <laughs> appearing. One of them was... Uh, new geometries, non-Euclidean geometries. So we found um, geometries which actually didn't satisfy one of um, uh, Euclid's axioms about parallel lines. Um, but they looked totally consistent, and, and that was, uh, we, we realised that there were just many sorts of geometry. But there was a worrying feel. Are they really consistent? Maybe these things have contradictions in them somehow, because they, they look kind of weird and new. These are geometries where parallel lines might meet, or there are many parallel lines. Um, and also, at that time, we see the idea of new sorts of infinities appearing. Infinity was a concept that 
uh, in the past was something you couldn't understand. But Cantor, at the end of the 19th century, is suddenly saying, no, we can understand this. There are many different sorts of infinity. You can pair, compare one against the other. But these new bits of mathematics started to raise questions about, you know, gosh, well, this looks very sort of worrying sort of um, area. Might this produce sort of contradictions or inconsistencies? And, uh, and it, we began to ask questions about our subject. Well, into this breach stepped David Hilbert, as I said in the introduction, John Barrow, brilliant young uh, German mathematician, and in a lecture to the International Congress of Mathematicians in 1900, he set out uh, an optimistic vision uh, called the Hilbert Program. Can you give us broad outlines of that vision and why it seemed the salvation and so important to mathematics? If something very dramatic had happened at the beginning of the 19th century, as Marcus alluded to, that long ago, at the time of Newton and back to the Middle Ages, uh, people thought that mathematics, and particularly Euclid's geometry, was the absolute truth of things. This described how the universe really was. It wasn't just a game like chess that had rules and axioms. But all of a sudden, at the beginning of the 19th century, people discovered that there could be other geometries. Geometries that described lines and points and behavior on curved surfaces. And all of a sudden, Euclid's geometry wasn't the absolute truth, it was just one possible geometry. And so mathematicians began to view their subject as a collection of self-consistent stories or, or games. And you didn't give any one of them a special status because it was actually true or a description of the real world. And so people had many, many geometries to think about um, and a different way of approaching mathematical structures developed. How did you test whether some new geometry or new logic that someone proposed was self-consistent? How do you know that it didn't have some horrible fallacy lurking upstream that if you kept reasoning you, the whole thing would collapse? And Hilbert was uh, a very great mathematician, probably one of the two greatest mathematicians of his day, who worked on a huge range of topics. And one of his areas of interest was the foundations of mathematics and trying to put it on a very firm foundation. And he was what became known to us as a formalist. He thought that we should just specify the starting axiom, specify the rules of the game, and then the definition of mathematics would be all the deductions that you could make from those starting axioms using the rules. And he thought this is absolutely foolproof. Um, no erroneous deductions can creep in if we do it right. It's like starting with a hen house full of uh, hens and chickens, come back later on, there can only be hens and chickens in there, assuming the fox can't get in. Um, so this was Hilbert's very sort of pedantic, almost Germanic approach to mathematics. He wanted it nailed down as a formalistic system. And in this lecture specifically, he listed 23 <coughs> problems that needed fixing or solving. We're going to focus on the second problem, which asked, I'm quoting here, can we prove that the theory of numbers is free of contradictions and that every statement about numbers can be proved within that system? That was the challenge he set himself and everybody else, and he worked on that for the next 30 years. Yes, Hilbert thought this was obviously true, and it was just a matter of... Uh, plugging away at this uh, to show that it was the case. And so that was, that was the thing that was vitally important <coughs> to him, to prove this. He thought if he did this, he'd got the whole thing in order. He'd got the equivalent of Leibniz's logic machine. Yes, he'd started work on a slightly simpler problem a couple of years before, and that was to rigorously lay out what were all the axioms of Euclid's geometry. I mean, Euclid actually... Uh, missed some out and there were certain very obvious things you couldn't prove with Euclid's axioms that were evidently true. Uh, and so he first of all did this for geometry uh, and he showed that uh, geometry was a complete and decidable system. What that means is that if you make a statement about geometry using the words and the, the concepts, uh, you can decide whether this is a, a valid statement of geometry and you can decide step by step whether it's true or false by reasoning from the starting assumptions. And so he thought that just by adding a few more rules, geometry would turn into arithmetic and we could produce the same proof that arithmetic was also decidable. 
Philip Welch, how did the um, development called set theory uh, play into what Hilbert was doing? <coughs> well, set theory had been more or less invented by uh, the German Georg Cantor in uh, 1873. We can almost date precisely the time and day where he discovered that there were different kinds of infinities. Uh, what Cantor was trying to do was to think about just infinity or infinite sets in the abstract. Previously to that, people had always thought of sets as being given by some rule or by some function. <clears throat> but Cantor was interested in just the overall global concept of what a set might be. Can you tell the listeners what a set might be? So we think of a set in mathematics as just being a collection of objects. And what we find is, in fact, this can be really rather general. <coughs> we think of a set as just being an aggregate of its members without any other properties other than just being this collection. Is there any way you can objectify that a little more? So the set of uh, people in this room consists of the four of us around the table here and that is just a collection and in mathematics this would be a set. We could have a set of points on the plane, we could have the set of decimal numbers along the real line, we could have the set of counting numbers. All of these things are mathematical sets. <clears throat> what Cantor was trying to do was to try and give a system in which one could just reason about a mathematical set. And how did that, did that run up against the idea that Marcus developed at the beginning of the program about axiom? Well, Cantor himself didn't actually lay down a formal system of axioms and this is obviously one of the things that Hilbert would have uh, would have liked is that there should be something formally giving us a system for set theory. It wasn't until Zamelo in 1908 actually laid down an, a formal axiomatic system there. Um, but there were already rather cracks appearing in this edifice of set theory and after 1900, uh, in Hilbert's um, um, announced speech of these programs, uh, of these problems, uh, Russell discovered a paradox in set theory. This is Bertrand Russell, yes. Mm -hmm. This is Bertrand Russell. Uh, Russell was working from a slightly different direction. He was uh, making a critique of uh, the German philosopher Gottlob Frege's attempts to reduce arithmetic to just purely logical principles. Now this was a different program from Hilbert's, it was called the Logicist program. And this was what Frege was essentially, this was his magnum opus, was to actually try and achieve this um, objective. Now Russell discovered that there was actually a paradox in Frege's system, that one couldn't just simply define willy-nilly a class of objects and that this would be a set. So there seemed to be problems about defining sets in general. So how did, it, did, it, did this paradox, as it were, if I say this correctly, there won't be flaw, uh, a flaw, the, 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 the set system. Can you walk us through this paradox? So the paradox is r roughly similar to a paradox called the Barber paradox. So one imagines, for the story of the sake of the Barber's paradox, that there is an island, and on this island, uh, all the adult males are shaven. Some shave themselves, and others are shaven by the barber. There's only one barber in this island and the barber shaves every, every male on this island who does not shave himself and only those males. So he shaves all and only those people who don't shave themselves. So the barber being a male, you ask the question, does the barber shave himself or not? And either way you try and work it out, it comes to a contradiction. Can you work it out a little bit and tell us how so, that works? If the uh, barber <coughs> does not shave himself, by definition he's supposed to shave all of the men who don't shave themselves, so he must shave himself. But if he does, does shave himself, then he, he's, he, he, he's not supposed to shave himself because he's supposed to shave only those people who don't shave themselves. So either way this comes to a, a contradiction. Now, Russell's paradox is the equivalent version of this. What Russell did was say, well, if I can define sets in general, just by any kind of description, why don't I define the set of all of those sets that are not members of themselves? Now, the set of these people in this room is an abstract object, right? It's not a person in this room. So the set of people in this room is not a member of itself. So Marcus is a member of the set of people in this room, so am I, so are you, so is John. 
but one could consider those possible realm of sets which are not members of themselves. Right? And if you consider all of those, that class of sets, and then you ask, is that class of sets, if that set is a member of itself or not? It's supposed to be the collection of all of those sets that are not members of themselves, so it can't be a member of itself. But if it's not a member of itself, then it must be, because it's the collection of all of those things that are not members of themselves. I'm glad you started with a barber on the island. <laughs> <laughs> right, Marcus, let's move on to 1931, another gathering on mathematicians, again at Königsberg. Uh, another brilliant man, young man delivering a lecture, this time Kurt Gödel. He, did a little de he delivered a lecture, uh, curious enough, the day before Hilbert's lecture, Hilbert not knowing. Well, yeah, this anyway, is never mind, that doesn't matter. No, it was, oh, well, it's kind of curious coincidence. Right, anyway, Hilbert but, well, let me finish the bit, bit involved, yeah, and then absolutely. you can talk for the rest of the programme. <laughs> and that destroyed Hilbert's vision. And he and his lecture was about the incompleteness theorem, so we've got to the subject. Right. Exactly. Right. So, uh, Hilbert actually was uh, receiving the citizenship of Königsberg the day after Gödel gave this lect uh, lecture. And um, he's he really summed up again the belief of most mathematicians um, with, a, with a talk he gave which says um, we will know we must know there was a feeling like uh, that any true statement we should be able to prove and we should be able to prove that mathematics um, is a self-consistent system um, but what Gödel had done the day before is to show that both of these projects were totally flawed first of all you cannot prove that a logical system for for number theory you cannot prove within that system that it is consistent, that it ha might doesn't have contradictions. Um, so it's impossible to prove within a, a system for number theory that there won't be contradictions. Secondly, he proved, in sense, this is what the incomplete is. Um, if you have, there are, there will be true statements about numbers which, within that system, you will never be able to prove. And this went really against what Hilbert believed. Hilbert finished uh, mentioned in his um, address in 1900 that there are no unknowables in mathematics. But Gödel was saying, no, it's an intrinsic part of mathematics that within number theory, there will be statements about numbers, true statements, which we'll never be able to prove within that axiomatic system. So it was incomplete. It was almost put some sort of uncertainty at the heart of mathematics, which was meant to be a subject which could get could prove 100 percent truths and, and, and prove all truths. John Barry, can we uh, continue on that, uh, on, as it were, the, the, the clash of these two theories, most curiously in, in, in two days, and just um, take, not take us, but address yourself to that, as, as Marcus has just done. Yes, I think there was only one person in Gödel's audience who really understood the impact of what he was telling them, and that was John von Neumann, who, who took up the idea so quickly that within a few days he had deduced the second theorem of Gödel's, and, but then was disappointed when Gödel told him that he'd in fact already proved that one too. Uh, so what, what Gödel was really showing, a sort of a pictorial edition of this that I, that I like to think of is if we think of a, a game board like chess where the rules of the logic are like the moving of the pieces um, then what Hilbert was imagining is that if someone showed you a configuration of pieces on the board you would always be able to tell whether that was a, a configuration that you could reach from the starting state of the game uh, and whether it was also an allowed configuration on the board. So if you look at a chessboard and all the pieces are on there and the two white bishops are both on white squares, that's clearly not allowed. But what Gödel's theorem is really saying is that there are configurations on the board which you cannot decide whether you could have reached those from the starting state or not, following the rules of the game. How, uh, how did Hilbert find out about Gödel's ideas and how did he react? I, I, he, well, Bernays, who was an associate of uh, Hilbert's, spoke to him about this, and apparently his first reaction was, was anger. <laughs> uh, he didn't want to hear about it. Uh, eventually, he seemed to come round to believing that Gödel really had proven what he'd said. Um, but there was still some resistance on, on his part, and in fact, he never published again on this subject. So did he thereby acknowledge that Gödel had uh, driven... Uh, I don't think he actually ever said anything in print about this, but no. I think the assumption is that 
since he didn't work on this project anymore, that he must have realised that Gödel had done this. John's referred to the fact that um, there only only one man there who understood it, but he, he got working on it. Presumably it spread right across the mathematical establishment community very quickly. Well, I, I think not. I think that... Um, people were rather slow to react. I mean, von Neumann took these results back to Princeton and talked about them there. Uh, other people seem not to really have absorbed the results very quickly. Um, Russell's reaction was, although he'd not been working in mathematical logic for some time, his reaction was, oh, are we supposed to now believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4.001? <laughs> And then he said, oh, I'm glad I'm no longer working in mathematical logic. Um, Zamelo, who'd formalized uh, set theory, uh, was now rather off in a world where he didn't work in first order logic, which is the logical system which these results are proven in. He was off in a slightly different world of his own working in a second, so-called second order logic, and he really didn't want to uh, understand too much about these, these theorems, I think. Uh, the French really didn't seem to pay very much attention to them immediately. Uh, the Bourbaki group seemed for some years not to have really understood what Gödel was talking about and still thought in print that the Hilbert system was still up and running. Before we move on into, and try to uh, and, and go more into the, uh, in, into this theorem, John Barr, it might be worthwhile for our listeners uh, to say that the difference between these two characters is, was part of the interest because of the difference between the two of them. Uh, can you just briefly sketch who th their differences? Mm. Hilbert was rather unusual. I mean, he was a German professor, so you might have expected that he would be very much in the Herr Doctor Professor highly formal Germanic mode. Uh, whereby professors didn't have anything much to do with younger people, um, younger lecturers, and certainly not with students. Um, but Hilbert was famous for not being like that, a bit of a scandal. So he was very interactive with young people, and he would have students to his home. And so one of the reasons I think his whole program became rather well known, and why we're talking about it, was because he did interact with a lot of people, and he became a focus for an awful lot of mathematics. Gödel, on the other hand, was completely reclusive, very, very strange person. Um, he had no collaborators, he had no research group, he worked on his own. He did very difficult things and he thought about them for a very, very long time before he published anything. Um, people said when they met him at Princeton that he was really rather terrifying because if you went to talk about anything you would soon discover within a matter of moments that he had thought through every implication of what you were going to say long ago you know, and saw immediately to the end of any argument that you were about to start. Um, One so of you has called him the greatest logician since Aristotle. So anyway, wait. Yeah, so, so they had very different personalities, even though they came from the same uh, sort of Germanic uh, tradition. They were very different sorts of people. Um, although Gödel did work in one other area other than logic, he worked in the general theory of relativity and found a rotating universe solution of Einstein's equations that allowed time travel to occur. So this astonished uh, Einstein. Uh, again, very remarkable that he was able to find an exact solution of Einstein's equations. Uh, a very difficult thing to do. Um, and so Hilbert also was involved in the foundations of general relativity. So culturally, temperamentally, they're really very different sorts of people. Can we just stay with these theorems for uh, uh, for a few minutes longer, Marcus? You yes. said, Dory, um, because because they are very important. Now we're going to try to track their effect, and their importance. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about how Gödel illustrated his theorems? Uh, and yes, and yes. I, I think it's I mean, really important to show yes, how, how he proved these things because yes, I think it's quite remarkable. Yeah. In a way, he takes one of these uh, sort of. Uh, linguistic paradoxes and encodes it inside number theory. Um, he takes the statement, this statement cannot be proved. And what he does is to produce something called the Gödel coding, which translate that sounds like a statement about language or um, a sort of meta statement. But he produces something called a Gödel coding, which actually uses my favourite numbers, the prime numbers, to change that into a statement about pure number theory. Now, so we've got this statement cannot be proved. Yes, it's right. now just a statement about numbers, m meaning something about numbers, using this girdle coding. 
Now, this statement about numbers. How does that work, though? How, do, how does it work? Yeah. It, it, it works by translating. Gosh, that's. Now you're really pushing me. <laughs> uh, it works by um, sort of translating. Every. Um, every symbol inside it, within that logical statement that i've said can be translated into uh, some sort of numerical value which has relationships between them according to their logical connections and so it can be translated into therefore a statement about numbers and not about the logic itself so uh, i don't want to be pushed further on that one because no, we're no. going to go for uh, I what i want to okay we've got to that, that, well, the well, hands are go going up right around the table yeah, let yeah, marcus yeah. finish yeah i'm going to finish this and then you can explain a little bit more about <laughs> the how the girdle coding works um uh because this is now a statement about numbers and therefore is either true or false now let's look at the implications of this if this statement is true let's reinterpret it back it says that this statement cannot be proved Sorry, I want to do is false. If it's false, it says this statement cannot be proved. So that means it's false, which means it can be proved. But if something can be proved, it's true. So that's contradiction. So the assumption that the statement was false must be false, which means the statement must be true. We reinterpret that back to the statement about language. It says this statement cannot be proved. So that is now a true statement. And therefore, Gödel has proved that there are statements which cannot be proved. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> I'm calling in Philip, but <laughs> and then John. Okay, I think it's important to um, note that actually the, the incompleteness theorems are really about syntax. They're given a syntactic statement. They're not really, and Gödel was careful to phrase these things in terms of syntax. So by syntax, I mean the, 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 the nuts and bolts of the actual formal system, the way the axioms are written down, the language that it's written in the finite set of deductive rules that you might have to work with the axioms. So the Gödel coding gives a mapping of these axioms, which can be an infinite set, they don't has, doesn't have to be a finite set of axioms, a mapping of the set of axioms into the numbers itself. And this is done in a sufficiently clever way so that formal things about moving the marks down on paper then become just simple operations on the, the code numbers. It's not really about semantics or truth, although you've given a very nice kind of explanation in terms of truth. But what Gödel wanted to do was to actually talk about uh, Hilbert's formal cons um, consistency program. And for that, he just needed to produce, or he had to produce something that was just syntactic rather than semantic. And he couldn't appeal to notions of truth to actually prove the theorem. So it's, careful, it's, it's important to note that the theorem is just stated in terms of syntax than semantics. John wants in, now we come back to Marcus. John. Yes, yeah, just to amplify a bit, I mean, so what Gödel managed to do was to, to set up this one-to-one -one correspondence between mathematics and statements about mathematics. And Marcus's prime numbers help you because one of the great theorems of mathematics is that if you take any number, I suppose um, uh, six, you can express it just as the product of the prime numbers that divide it, so uh, 2 times 3. And there's only one way to do that for every number. And so he decided that if he had a formula or a statement like 2 plus 2 is 4, that he would attribute a prime number to each ingredient of that statement. So the, to the 2, as it were, in inverted commas, the plus and the other 2, the equals and the 4, and then he could multiply those prime numbers together and get a number which uniquely characterised that statement. And so then he's got a way of using numbers to encode statements about numbers. And that allows him then to follow through on Marcus's sort of paradox to, to get the contradiction. And this paradox, I think, is a bit like those cards that people, might, uh, listeners, might know. The, we say the statement on the other side of this card is true, and you turn it over, and it says the statement on the other card side of this card is false, and you can't make any sense of that one. But the the wonderful thing is that when you um, when Gödel looks at this thing, you can make sense of it, and the implications are that there are true statements about numbers which cannot be proved within that formal system. How <coughs> how radical did this? come to be thought of as being. I hope that sentence is syntactically <laughs> approved by Philip there. Matega. Well, I, I think in some ways mathematicians, 
Uh, I mean, I'm a mathematician, so I'll talk from a mathematical point of view rather than the philosoph philosophical one. I don't think it really had very much impact because mathematicians are really just getting on with their subject. It worked. It didn't seem to have any contradictions in it. It seemed to be um, consistent. Uh, the sort of things that you wanted to prove, eventually you seem to be able to prove. Um, so on the whole, I think mathematicians felt, well, OK, we may not be able to prove that um, number theory um, is consistent, doesn't have contradictions, but the more we do it, the more that gives us evidence that it's not going to give us contradictions. There was one interesting point, which is this uh, guy Cantor, who looked at infinite sets. Um, he asked a question which was actually Hilbert's first question, um, which was, is there an infinite set between the set of counting numbers and the set of infinite decimal numbers? They're two different sorts of infinity. One, and two, three, four, five, six, and then pi. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six are the counting numbers. So that's one. That's the sort of first sort of infinity. And then Cantor discovered that if you take things like pi, square root of two, mm. um, that these are a different quality of infinity, bigger than the, 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 the whole numbers. And he, Cantor asks, is there a set, infinite set of numbers which is strictly bigger than the counting numbers and strictly smaller than all the infinite decimal numbers. And this was actually, Hilbert Cho thought this was so important that he chose this as the first problem on his list. Now, the amazing thing which Gödel contributed to, um, but was eventually Paul, proved by Paul Cohen in the 60s, was we came to the realisation that both answers could be true. There could be an infinite set there, and there also couldn't be. That the, You could actually add a statement into as an axiom um, that there is an infinite set between these two, and the system would remain consistent, and we could add its negation. And this it was, in a way, showing us in a similar way that the non-Euclidean non geometries showed us there are many sorts of geometries we suddenly came to the realization there are actually many different sorts of mathematics and quite often you have to make a statement about which axioms you're using are you using something called the continuum hypothesis or not so it does impact on mathematicians it does seem john barrow that we are uh, just from very much from a, a sort of uh, uh, amateur outsider uh, entering into a world with, where things have changed i mean what you're talking about all three of you is well actually people got on with their jobs and it was uh, but for instance, uh, uh, one of Gödel's contemporaries, Hermann Weyl, said the incompleteness theorems were, quote, a constant drain on the enthusiasm and determination with which I pursued my research work. Put colloquially, for some people seem to have thought that the bottom dropped out of their uh, faith in the power of uh, traditional mathematics. As if you were a formalist, <coughs> like uh, Hermann Weyl was, then it would be a rather psychologically inhibiting Result. So you would have expected uh, to be able to decide the truth or falsity of any statement that you were given in arithmetic. So if you were involved in that sort of research on the foundations of mathematics, then it had a big impact. It was the most important result ever proved. But if you were someone uh, building aeroplanes and using applied mathematics for that purpose or studying oscillations of waves and uh, doing algebra and so forth, non-Euclidean geometry, then it didn't really impact upon your daily life. Uh, and if it ever had, uh, you had a simple remedy. You see, what it was saying, if you had a particular number of axioms, you're going to encounter statements that you can't show to be true or false. Um, but all you need to do, perhaps, is then add another axiom to your system. You could create two new systems, one in which the undecided statement is true, another where it's false, and carry on. There'll be new undecided statements created by doing that. But an applied mathematician would sort of work their way around this incompleteness. It's only if you're a logician that you really need to understand it very deeply and you want to identify problems which are undecidable. Philip Welsh. I think another <coughs> aspect that's important to emphasise about <coughs> uh, these incompleteness theorems is they don't in any way raise doubt about the consistency of the formal system piano <coughs> arithmetic, which we axiomatise um, um, arithmetical notions. They don't, they don't raise any doubt also about zamelo frankel the axiomatic system that, we, that really encompasses almost all of mathematics. Um, indeed, Gerhard Gensen, a German mathematician, showed that piano arithmetic could be consistent by going to a, a larger system where one was allowed to do inductions infinitely often up to some 
certain number of times. So it's not that we suddenly had doubts about whether piano arithmetic really was consistent or not. One could go to a simply stronger theory and prove the consistency of piano arithmetic in that stronger theory. So I d logicians, I think, were not in any wor worry that the whole house of mathematics was going to collapse because of the Gödel theorems. I think it's also uh, important to point out that all the theorems <coughs> that had been proved up to that point were still true. It didn't shatter anything um, that had been proved up to that point. It just showed that there were things that were maybe beyond being able to be proved within a particular system. Um, and I think it di did create a uh, worry in people. I, I, I like your quote, uh, a Viles quote, actually, because it does mean if you're working on something like the Goldbach conjecture, is every even number uh, the sum of two prime numbers? Well, what if that's actually an undecidable statement and you're dedicating your whole life to trying to prove this thing and actually within the system that you're working in um, it's not going to be able to be proved so there's I think it does create a sneaking worry and most mathematicians stick their head in the sand and try and ignore it. Did it bring up uh, a, a, a debate about the difference between proof and truth in mathematics? John? John yes I don't know whether it brought up a debate I mean it demonstrated that there was a difference between truth and, and, and proof so that there could be statements that are uh, that can be proved true in one system <coughs> but not proved true in another system so Girdle is showing that if you have a certain number of rules and assumptions there's only an amount of information there really to get at doing certain things and perhaps you shouldn't be too surprised by that mathematicians previously had encountered impossibilities they knew that there were things that you couldn't do that uh, a simple equation that had a fifth order uh, polynomial you know we meet quadratics at school ax squared plus bx plus c is naught and we know there's a handy formula for finding the solution for x and there is if it's a cubic or a quartic equation but you could prove that there could be no such formula for a fifth order equation so mathematicians had experience of proofs that something could not be done. And this was a reflection of the complexity of the system they were dealing with. The way I interpret Gödel is that what he's saying is that if you have a logical system that's complicated enough, then you have this incompleteness. And the level of critical complexity arrives when you add arithmetic. Because there's no Gödel theorem for Euclidean geometry. So that's every statement of geometry can be decided true or false. But it's when you add numbers and arithmetic that the incompleteness kicks in. And I think the reason is, is because of this prime number factorization, that individual numbers can be identified by this prime uh, factorization. So they're uniquely specified by their factorization and that means that you can have a link between statements about them and numbers unambiguously whereas in geometry there are points and lines and they're all identical that so there isn't a way of identifying a point and therefore having this correspondence between statements about points and points. Um, yes I think Hilbert famously said that uh, in his axiomatization <coughs> of geometry he wasn't concerned what the points and lines were. They could be beer yeah, mugs, yeah. penguins, or uh, <laughs> tables. Whatever, and chairs, or tables. Yeah. Um, I mean, Hilbert had this kind of, perhaps at least this kind of thin vision of mathematics as being the set of, I mean, I think he said at some point it was just an inventory of uh, provable formulae. Uh, Gödel, on the other hand, had this rather rich kind of platonic conception of mathematics. This is an example of the differences in their character. Uh, he had this rich platonic conception of uh, an objective world of mathematical objects, perhaps outside of space and time, but nevertheless uh, something that one could have some access to through mathematical intuition. Hilbert, on the other hand, as I said, had this rather thin formal um, formalist view of the matter. Did what? What relevance did uh, did 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 Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorems have, have? What does it have to computers, for instance? Uh, well, interestingly, one can derive now uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorems from Turing's work on the undecidability of the halting problem. So this was something that emerged in the same decade in the 30s when Turing went to Princeton to work with uh, Church, an associate of Gödel's there. Turing and Gödel never actually met, but um, Turing was trying to provide a foundation for 
um, well, what we would now call computer science, but uh, he invented the whole idea of a machine himself, or a computing machine, and gave the mathematical theory for it. And what Turing showed was that there was no, a kind of an equivalent, or something equivalent to Gödel's theorem, that there was no way that one could decide of a given program whether it was actually going to halt on a certain input. And we can now view this inc um, undecidability, the halting problem, as a version of this Gödel incompleteness theorem. I think Not there's also a sort of positive spin that um, mathematicians put on Gödel as well, which is in relationship to the computer, because um, a computer can be set to churn out all the theorems of mathematics within an axiomatic system. You just get it going through all the different possibilities of proofs. And this is, Gödel's incompleteness theorem is sort of saying, well, there are things that the computer will not be able to get access to through this formal system, but mathematicians, by looking at the system, looking outside the system, working outside the thing, might be able to get at those truths and show that they're true within another system. And so there was a, a positive spin to inc the incompleteness theorem, which is saying somehow mathematicians are better than computers. Can you, uh, I'm sorry about this, John, but can you briefly give us some idea of the way waves were made in other disciplines uh, because of the incompleteness theorems? Well, philosophers and scientists latched onto it in strange ways that you still read about today. So there was you know, a, a, a rather quick reaction from some people that, that thought that on the one hand, just as it was showing you that computers can never replace human beings, you know, that there were mathematical truths that the computer could never reach and only human intuition could get at it. So perhaps because science and physics is based on mathematics, there was some incompleteness about physics and science that we could never know all the mathematical laws of nature. And you sometimes saw this even being cited by by theologians and uh, like y Yaki, for example, as being a, a, a limit to human understanding of the universe. And then there were others who took a more optimistic view, like Freeman Dyson, who saw it, it was just confirming that discovery could never be complete. You know, we were always going to be exploring and finding new things about the universe. Well, with rather pedantic appropriateness, we have to end this programme in completely covering the subject. I'm very sorry for that. But thank you very much, Marcus Sotoy, John Barrow and Philip Welsh. Uh, I think this will arouse a lot of interest among our listeners. And next week, hold on, we're going to talk about uh, the 18th and 19th century quest for the spark of life and the science behind Frankenstein. Thank you for listening.